So my name is Dave Cameron. I am the children's pastor at Bothell, uh, Cedar Park Church in Bothell. That's the, the place that I am. So I know some of you, and hopefully, um, as Rebecca was talking about, I'll get to know a few more of you. Uh, this is a great place to be. Um, I've been, I'm actually from Canada originally, and then moved to, I grew up in Edmonton, Alberta, greatest city in the world, and then moved to a better city, Vancouver, BC, and then got to come down to Seattle. So I've already been in great places. So it's uh, really fun. So my wife is American. That's my, um, the way that I came down in 2006 and we have three kids now so seven five and three and with each kid they get a little more stubborn we had no idea with the first one we thought this is what a strong-willed child looks like and then the next one comes the next one so and you guys all know that working with children the strong-willed kids you don't ever really break their uh well break their will at all you just you just try to direct that river in a certain direction well well anyways um I, uh, it's, it's November 11th, so I'd like to start out this way. I know that um, this probably isn't our focus, but is there anyone here who has served in the military, uh, past, prior, or even currently? Um, just indicate that. Okay, that's no problem. I'd like to start out with a prayer for anyone. And if there was anyone in here, I'd want to pray for them specifically and thank them for their service because they truly are the heroes of this nation. Um, agree or disagree with whatever policy has been made, but there's people who have uh, given their lives to serve us. And so my grandpa was in the war, and he's one of my heroes. And we're going to talk about heroes today as well. So that's um, where we're going. So I want to pray for the heroes on this day. Um, Let's start there, and then I'll start uh, chatting. Lord Jesus, I thank you for this time we have together. And right now, I just thank you for those who've laid down their lives, and whether they've given their lives fully and completely, or at least given their lives in service. We just thank you for them, Father God. I pray that today, um, uh, more than any other day, that you would just be with them, bless them, be with their families. I pray that that they would come to know you and serve you and honor you. And I also pray that they would know how thankful we are for what they have done. Uh, We ask this all in Jesus' name. I pray you'd be with us during this time as well. Help us to see uh, in the past and then get get inspired for what the future uh, may look like in Pentecostal ministry for children. So I ask that all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, if you look at the title, it's Spirit-Empowered Pentecostal uh, Children's Ministry, or Pentecostal, I guess, got taken out, which is good. That comes with a whole lot of labels, and people have uh, biases on that, good or bad. But but Spirit-Empowered is probably a better way to say it, so that's a good way to start. So what if you grab one of the uh, number three books, I think this chapter will be in there. I haven't seen it yet to make sure. I'm sure if one's going to get cut out, it would probably be mine, and that's okay. But no, it's it was a fun process to go through. I love history. I'm kind of one of those nerds, so you're probably going to get just a whole bunch of information and just process it and think it through. I do have a conclusion, which was really cool out of this. I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to see, but I do think there's some things that I saw um, through it, and I'm excited to hear at the end if we have time. I'm hoping to have at least 15 minutes so we can talk about um, what, to draw out of this, and then even some of you, if we have time, tell me where I've wrong, I'm wrong or where I've missed something, because this is just me looking through history and what's happened in pretty much in America in Pentecostal children's ministry, which is such a narrow view, but still a really cool view as well. That's our heroes of the faith who went before us. So. I want to kind of throw this out there right at the beginning, is that children have been at the forefront of Pentecostal ministry from the beginning. They've never been forgotten. There's never been, I mean, if when you get into the 1980s or 1990s, you just say, oh, that's when we got children's ministry down because we started hiring children's pastors. No, that's not true. Uh, now, yes, it's okay to hire children's pastors. So that's not a bad thing at all. But children were at the forefront of that ministry or of our thought process even before that. So um, if you can go to the next slide, Caitlin. Uh, you've heard this line, the, pa- the uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. So I've been working on this line. I don't know if it's true or not yet, but show me your past and I can predict your future. I'm not trying to really grab anything except for let's start thinking a little bit. But I do think that the past will help us determine. Actually, I've been to, I've served at three different churches and... Um, I think, I'm trying to work on this theory, there's not much here yet, but I'm trying to work on a theory that I think every church has their little who they are. 
And that's pretty cool. Uh, so when you look at the, well, look at the second church that I was at, that was a church built on prayer. They had people praying for hours upon hours upon hours. We had a new pastor come in, and he, we still prayed, obviously, but he took the focus into small groups, and the church kind of went down. And it's just this thought process of, small groups are great, I'm not anti-small groups, but it just, didn't quite work with that congregation. And the church that I grew up at is built on worship and built on teaching of the Word. And it's the same pastor, so they haven't changed. But I wonder if you change that to put some other emphasis in there, if it would. Now, it's just a thought I'm working on. I haven't done much research other than the churches that I've been at. Um, But I think it can portray out into a larger level of what have the assemblies of God. That's kind of where I focus. Although, um, when you read the chapter, you'll see that there is so much more that goes into uh, children's ministry in the Pentecostal world. The Pentecostal world is not limited to the assemblies of God. I hope you know that. I hope you know that. I hope you know that we have gotten that title that's cool. And it's, it, there's baggage that's come with it because we have our beliefs and some people really hate pretty much the one belief of speaking in tongues is the evidence of baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is really too bad um, that we've got there and really have shut that down. But if you go into Amy Semple McPherson, she's a Pentecostal lady. She was actually in... No, I shouldn't say the, but she was right at the beginning of the Assembly of God, right there uh, in the group of Azusa Street and then... She goes off into the foursquare. And then you just, there, there's all these different groups that come out of that. Um, so it's not just limited to us, but we're going to focus on us right now. So, but not to the detriment to saying anyone else is not as good. That's not the heart ever. Let's go to the next slide here. I'm going to break it down into four sections for you today. Um, and the sections kind of fit like this, that we go, we're going to talk about pre-Pentecostal movement and look specifically, what was children's ministry like or what were some of the things that, that influenced Pentecostalism? Um, and uh, thinking mostly Assemblies of God, although it gets murky there because it's all pre. And then early Pentecostalism, well, you look at 1906 is when I started it, but if we're looking at the Assemblies of God, that's now 1914 that that started. So I uh, take that for what it is, but that's where, where I'm going with that one. So 1906 is obviously when Azusa Street happened happens, and then I'm going to 1950. I like it because it's a nice number there, but I also, as I was going through the research, there's one really intriguing person who I think set the foundation for some amazing things to happen in the Assemblies of God. And he uh, was kind of serving until about 1950, although he, well, well, we'll get to him, and he was a neat guy. Then maturing Pentecostalism, 1950 to 2000, and we'll see really in the maturing Pentecostalism, you see the rise of programs. You see a lot of kind of just stuff going on uh, to begin with in early Pentecostalism, and then you see programs rise, and these are neat programs. These are life-changing programs. God does some amazing, amazing things. And then we're going to look very quickly at the modern Pentecostalism. So um, in this, you, if you read the book and make it through the whole chapter, if you do, good for you. It's just full of details and I don't even make it through most of the time when I read it again. But uh, I could only focus on the first three and then I ran out of room. And I tried to make it shorter. But So this last one, it will be a little bit different information and um, it won't be in the book. But it's, it's I mean... Really well, I'll I'll get there in a minute. So let's go to the next one here. Let's start with that pre-Pentecostal movement. So if we're looking at who influenced the Pentecostals, who influenced the Azusa Street, who influenced the William Seymours, the Charles Parhams, it was the Methodist Church. We're looking at John Wesley. So I'm going to take one step back from John Wesley as well before getting there. And John Wesley... One of the big influences on him, one of the neat stories, is he's actually traveling from America back to England at one point, and there's this huge storm. And this is, I mean, this is back when you're traveling by boat is your only option. So there's this huge storm that comes up, and John Wesley is on this boat with these Moravians, is what they were called, this Moravian church. And so John Wesley looks at them and says, Why aren't they scared? And he starts asking some questions, starts connecting with them, and sees they have a level of faith that they know who they are. They know who God has made them, and they know where they're going. And John Wesley didn't have that at that time. And so when he got back to England, 
he had to find Count Zizendorf. He is the leader of the, Ma- the, the Moravian Church. Just a great name, Count Zizendorf. And so he went to find him, and he spent some time with him. So and if you track it down, the Moravian Church is still alive and well today. And if you look for their uh, children's ministry, it is, it is a neat children's ministry that they build. They have uh, events going on. They have things that they're doing all the time. Um, so that, that is still alive and well. But Count Zizendorf, right back there to that guy, he was a writer of him. He had four hymnals that he wrote, and one of them was dedicated to children. So, reaching children with theological songs. Reaching children with, this is, uh, it, so, I mean, he, he could have focused just on adults, but, but he didn't. So we see right at the beginning, even before the beginning of Pentecostalism, there's influence. Now, did John Wesley see that and say, oh, I need to be involved in children's ministry? I have no clue. But... I know that the pieces were there. The pieces were in place. Uh, So then, moving on to John Wesley, there's two distinct ways that I think that we can see John Wesley and the Methodists really start to connect and to drive children's ministry forward. The first one is catechism. Um, You see a man named William Capers, uh, a Methodist Episcopal pastor. He's actually a bishop for a while. And what he did was he produced a catechism that focused on children in 1850. Um, So this this is a long long time ago. And if you look at that, you can actually look it up online. So if you do get the book, I put all of the things. I hope they all made it in there. You can, I put the exact URL in there uh, for the website. Just go in there, click on that. It'll take you right to the catechism. You, actually, you can actually print it out at this point. It's common. Um, uh, anyone can get it. And so what it is, really, it's junior Bible quiz. Who is God? Who is the Holy Spirit? Who am I? Who? It's just question and answer. And if you look at, I think it's William Capers. There's another guy who gets in there as well, um, and and wrote uh, or produced a, a catechism. And one of them is you look through it, and this is just completely directed to children. The very first page is a man who looks like he's a little bit older, standing, sitting down, and about 12 to 15 kids standing around him, and he's obviously teaching them. And then every page, I believe, in one of them uh, has a picture of something, and it's a connection. Um, obviously, they're connecting kids in. So this is very early on, or very, uh, let's say, long ago. I mean, I, I would, I'd argue if we keep going back into history, uh, into the church history, we see that children were continually on the forefront. I think, um, well, I haven't gone that far, so I shouldn't make too many statements. But we see VBS as well. Uh, the VBS was put on the very first one. Oh, let's go forward one slide. The very first one was unofficially put on by J- Bishop John Vincent in 1873. And again, he was a Methodist. He was a Methodist um, priest. Oh, I copied a couple of slides. There. Okay, he was a Methodist uh, bishop. Um, so I put this in there. I wanted to read just one section on this as well to go backwards one step. So uh, Catechism, VBS, I got ahead of myself for a second. But this was the, the heart of the entire uh, Methodist movement in 1850. The bishops got together and they, um, they created this, this statement for the general conference that we want to do these things. So it's a long thing and it's, it's pretty, well, it's, it's, it's interesting. I shouldn't say it's boring. For those who like those details, it's really interesting. But this was fascinating for us. So they say, we must connect Methodism with whatever is true and valuable, pure and beautiful, in science and letters, and our children must identify the scriptural boundaries, doctrines, I don't know where boundaries came from, doctrines of the church of their fathers with the recollections and associations uh, not only in the Sunday school room but also in the halls of learning. Think of how fascinating that is. They're not even talking about let's just take over our own space. I mean, I don't know if you've um, been reading things that are coming out in Pentecostalism right now but in the higher levels uh, we got a lot of let's take back the workplace. Um, which is really neat. Charlie Self is on that. Tom Nelson in our, our movement. and They're neat ideas of uh, that we should never have lost them. But whatever you do, it's work unto the Lord. But the Methodists are there right now with their children. Let's make sure that we teach our children these things. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So their heart was to see kids trained, to see kids know Jesus. Um, so I talked about this one as already uh, very similar to JBQ, the, the, the catechism. Uh, 
John Wesley actually produced a catechism himself. I shouldn't say produced. He actually, it looks like, took John Calvin's short catechism. John Calvin wrote like three or four. And he took the short one and made it his own and changed a couple of things. Um, So he produced his own, you can kind of say. Then the unofficial roots of VBS go back to the uh, Bishop John Vincent in 1873 and he talked about this is a great way to connect with kids, a great way to see kids come to know and think of the impact of VBS in our world at this point. Uh, Let's go to the next slide. Um, So the conclusion of the pre-Pentecostal part is that before Pentecostalism even began, the influences that we want to see children know Jesus, we want to see children discipled, we're already there. We weren't making these things up as we go. We weren't saying, you know what? The Holy Spirit's fallen. We want to make sure we pass this on to kids, don't we? No, these things were already there. So the the impetus was already within us. Okay, let's go on to early Pentecostalism. So in 1906, we see that the Holy Spirit fell on the group of people at Azusa Street. Um, And children were not forgotten. This is kind of a fascinating little... um, Cecil Robeck is kind of the guy to read for any historical uh, uh, foundations of Azusa Street. Really neat guy. Um, and so one of the things he wrote here, as you can see, I tried, I, I started taking out all my footnotes. If you want to read the footnotes, just look in the book. You can find them. Or if you want to come, just email me. That's fine as well. But So this one is here. I did leave it in. But th- he's building the case that the, the, the mission... Some people think this was a move of God and people went and then left. Well, the reason they think that is because the people talking about it went and left. Many people came to visit for a week, three days, uh, or two weeks, and then they went back and brought the message of Azusa Street or the Holy Spirit baptism on, uh, on us back to where they were. But this was just a local church. And William Seymour only ever saw it as a local church. They had, uh, well, you can read through here, that they had their own trustees, they incorporated, they bought their building at one point. Um, They just went through the normal church rhythms of life. But then look at this. Right at the beginning, that it ran a children's church on Sunday afternoons in the upper room on the second floor. Now, they, uh, it seems like for those three years, from 06 to 09, they were meeting every single day of the week. We don't have any any evidence that they were doing children's ministry every single day. Okay, but they were. They, they were actively saying, if we want this message to be passed on, or maybe they hadn't got that far yet, we just want to teach kids scripture. We just want kids to know who Jesus is. And think through the passion and the... We're going to make this happen every single week. We're going to find volunteers. We're going to decorate our room. We're going to whatever it is. Um, And I think it, yeah, it even says in the upper room, if you uh, look into the way that the building was where it, you know, listening to Rebecca and her talking about how she went downstairs, the door opens and bam. I mean, so think through, we have our own spaces for kids. And sometimes that just drives me nuts because kids shouldn't be off to the side except... Sometimes that's the way our buildings worked, and that's exactly the way their building worked at that time as well. So you see that they're saying, we want to make sure that these kids know Jesus. This is right from the beginning. This is our heritage. This is who we are, the the good and the bad. And they're saying right from the beginning, we want people to know who Jesus is. Let's go to the next one. One of the early leaders in the church um, was a man named J. Roswell Flower. He, from 1914, when the assemblies actually started, so like that's kind of the national office, although I can't imagine at that point there was very much prestige with this new movement that everybody thought were people filled with demons. So they're in this. They're making the statement, we want to be part of this. And so from 1914 until 1957, he was serving in these capacities. This is a a guy who he has a lot of influence and a lot of people who are looking to him for leadership. Well, we have evidence that his wife, Alice Reynolds Flowers, was uh, teaching Sunday school herself. And her thing was basically writing Sunday school curriculum. Um, which it, just another link in the chain of this was right from the beginning and happening in many different spots and not just as a, at Azusa Street but also in other places. Um, to the next slide. 
Uh, we have evidence of, well, more than evidence, these orphanages. One of them is still there today. I didn't get confirmation that Marie Stephanie's is there today. But Marie Stephanie, she felt like she wanted to go to China. And so she went. And one of the things that happened when she was there was there was a, a, an extreme famine. Um, just a, a, It was terrible in the 1920s. And so many families just brought her these boys. Actually, boys were being left out in the street and um, she just went and gathered them. And so she started an orphanage. And so out of this orphanage, we see this great vision and this great ministry that, that comes, a very holistic ministry of let's take care of children. Gladys Hinson in the 1940s, she had the same desire, actually the exact same desire to go to China, and she couldn't. Um, because uh, the, the war began, and so she couldn't get over to China. So what did she do? Well, spirit-empowered leader, she said, okay, well, I'm going to start it in Arkansas. <laughs> and so she did, with the blessing of the Assemblies of God, which is really cool. And so she started in Arkansas. And if you go to, I think it's Hillcrest um, Orphanages, it's still there today. And if you, this is the neatest thing. Sometimes, you, you know, things start like the YMCA and then they start to lose their scriptural, spiritual. If you go to Hillcrest right now and just go to their website, I think I put a quote in there. I tried to grab quotes from websites to show people love kids. People, the vision is still there to see kids come to know Jesus. This isn't a, uh, we, we're a Christian influence. No, this is, we want to change kids for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's go to the next slide. So, early Pentecostalism, uh, we see one other guy, and this is the guy that I talked about. His name is Marcus Grable. And Marcus Grable got the nickname of Mr. Sunday School. He was actually just, I believe, a janitor. Just a janitor. He had no theological background or training, but he was spirit-empowered and called by God. And in whatever way, he got into a position where he was the director of Sunday school at the national level. And under him, Sunday school grew 300% just exploded. I don't know if you've ever looked kind of back in history. We don't have them much today, but there's actually, there was a Sunday school program, a training program he'd send around the country, and then there was a pin that you could get, and you couldn't be a Sunday school teacher until you went through and did your training. I mean, I, you look at that and say, uh, some, sometimes we're just looking for a volunteer who's going to keep the kids safe and try to teach them something. Okay, but he went to the other extreme and said, no, no, this is so valuable. We want people to take this very seriously. Now, we've maybe the pendulum swing, swung. It'd be neat to come back that way a little bit. But this is Marcus Grable, and he's pushing this. And he, he's pushing that stone up the hill. And I think he got to a crest, and it starts to roll. That's kind of my thought about making 1950, where for children's ministry, you start seeing maturing Pentecostalism. Uh, but he instituted BGMC. And if you just go to the website, has anyone ever gone to the website and just see how much money they've raised? I believe it's over $80 million. And that's not prorated. That is from the start in 1950, I believe. It was actually, he left in 1949, so he instituted, but it started just after he left. That is his vision to see kids connect with missions. And he had this great line, and think, I, I, I could see us saying this line today and having no concept that this is from history as well, uh, of just saying, you know, I want my kids to know about missions. How do I connect them to know more about missions? And here's what they said in 1948, 1949. If children are to grow up to be adults concerned about missions, they must be taught about missions in their formative years. You have to talk about it now. N all of us are on board. But they were on board too. This is nothing new. This, this, this is who we are, is to see kids become who they're called to be. And missions is such an important part of that. So Marcus Grable, uh, then there's one, let's go to the, the next one. He, he stepped down in 1949, but this is one of my favorite quotes from the whole, you know, searching for everything that I found in this. But just, I'm going to read the whole quote. So he's, in, uh, he's resigned, he's retired, he can just go off and do whatever. Three days before he dies, in retirement, his interest in Sunday schools never flagged. Sorry, four days before his death in 1970, he participated in a parade that was part of a kid's crusade at Calvary Temple uh, Assembly of God. Dressed as a farmer, he pushed a, pushed a wheelbarrow on a three-mile parade route with a display he had made himself. The sign on, this, on it summed up his life's work. 
pushing for our kids. This is the passion that we feel. People have felt this passion before. I hope my, my hope in this is that it inspires you to say, hey, I'm part of something bigger than myself. And let's get to the end and say, okay, God, where do you want to take us? So i got to have myself a little bit there. But, but Marcus Grable, I think, is one of those unsung heroes that I, it's kind of a story I want to keep telling at this point now. Because just think that through. <laughs> I'm thinking just in my mind, this feeble elderly guy in the church, we have a lady named Betty Horton who she cannot... Uh, serve in our children's ministry anymore because she can't drive at night. So, But she can drive herself still. And so what she does at this point, because we say, just do whatever you want. We come and serve. So she buys us uh, little teddy bears. And we see these teddy bears in the stores. I don't know where she gets them, but sometimes they're $20, $30, and she comes in with bags of them. And we just... We just give them out as prizes and we say, thank you so much, Betty. And then we give her you know, a card to say, thank you for this. And we find it back in our box right away because she doesn't want anything. And I know she's not rich. I know she's on a fixed income. But these are the type of people. That's what I think of Marcus Grable. That's what I think of, uh, of him doing, of I will just give my life for these children. And that's where we are. And that's, uh, we're, we're inspired. But it goes beyond us. Um, okay, let's keep going. I don't want to get too far off on that. So early Pentecostalism... The burgeoning movement of Pentecostalism never wavered in the belief that children's ministry was important, that children's ministry mattered. There was never, ever a thought that this is an unimportant endeavor. Um, Okay, let's keep going. So maturing Pentecostalism. I have a feeling, and I could be wrong, I haven't, kind of like the theory I shared earlier, I haven't thought it through enough, But as I'm looking through this, you know what happened right after Marcus Grable left? We had all these programs start coming. I have a feeling Marcus Grable pushed that stone up the hill. It got to that crest and it hit maybe that tipping point, whatever helps you kind of think through that that thought process. And it started rolling. Because what do we see in the 1950s and the 1960s? We see some life-changing, amazing programs start in the assemblies. Now, you may like them or you may not like them at all. They may work great for your context. They may not work at all. That's not the point. But think through what these programs have done over the years. We have the Missionettes program uh, for girls. Let's go on to the next slide. Uh, Started... Thinking of spirit-empowered ministry, Goldie Olson, just a leader in a church, she had a dream. And in her dream, it was these girls wearing yellow, I believe it was yellow, I don't think it says in here, if you read, read through you might find it, but it was in, I think it was yellow outfits. And that was her dream. And she, she woke up and said, Ah, I have it. And you can read through here. She says, I have it. I know what I should do to help bridge that gap between kids coming out of children's ministry into their youth, making sure they stay in the church. And Missionettes was born out of that. Which is actually fascinating to me because that means that it probably started as a youth focused one and then bridged down whereas in I and I do think there's there's an importance of knowing your history to understand how things work and with impact under children's ministry I think there's a loss of connection to that women's ministry and Royal Ranger a loss of connection to that men's ministry because the programs aren't built on let's run a really cool program the kids want to be part of no it's not the program the programs these two uh, impact and Royal Rangers Let's mentor boy, boys and girls to become men and women of God. And that's the heart behind it. And I believe when you do that, the, there will be success with it. And success, I mean, it, it, seeing one kid transformed, that's success. That's why we're here. Um, but then there's more than that as well, because we, every number is a kid. Okay, let's keep going. So Goldie, uh, in 1949, she has that dream, I think, and then it was in... Uh, 1955, that's what it is. Missionettes begins. It receives national recognition. Um, and you just think, look, just look at the foundation they put down here. We want women to train younger women in the faith in line with Paul's instruction in Titus 2, verses 3 to 4. I mean, just think of the depth of that children's ministry they just created. Now, it's not, no one's calling it children's ministry. No one, it's, it's women. And, it, but just think of the, the, this is this is our history. This is our heritage. These guys loved children. Then move on to the next one. Um, 
the Royal Rangers. <coughs> we see the Royal Rangers program begins in 1962. And it was actually a man named Burton Pierce who, uh, he saw boys uh, uh, leaving or not becoming men of God, leaving the church. So he said, what can we do to uh, address that? And so he gave Johnny Barnes, anyone know who Johnny Barnes is? Yeah, Johnny Barnes. He gave Johnny Barnes, he said, go build a program. What a neat place to be there. And Burton was, uh, uh, oh look, secretary of the men's fellowship um, at the national level. So this program, on the next slide, it's built to mentor boys to become men of God through scripture memorization, learning new skills, events, Bible reading, and more. And um, this is a fantastic program. It's actually one of my the, the most enjoyable things I get to do. And I've worked really, really hard at trying to to tell people that this is about mentoring boys to become men of God. And I know this program is so intensive, but the more you get that message out there, I'll just, this is one of my favorite times, I think at this point, because after three, I've been three years in this position um, as children's pastor, so in my little kids class that I'm always kind of part of as well, I've got now five men that are there every week. Now, we're usually struggling to find one or two. And this was the one that I think I caught the heart of a little bit more quickly. There's other things that I don't do as well. But So I, I just keep telling the dads as they come drop off, hey, you can come in and it's, it's about seeing boys become men of God. And I think that has started to, although I could be totally wrong, it could be just random. The dads just are saying, I feel guilty, I'm not spending enough time with my son. Okay, that's cool too. But having guys there, it changes everything. Even just having them there and and um, I've, heard, I've heard people over the years say, well, with this program, you need to have a teacher in the classroom. I just don't think you do. You need to equip a man of God to be able to teach at some point. Okay, granted. But we just need men of God there. Because um, if we go down the road of we need a teacher in the classroom, what can happen is we get a mom to go in. <laughs> and, and which is great as well. If you're a mom in a Royal Ranger classroom, that's awesome. Because that's step one. But then let's get men of God in there because those boys, they need to just... Well, they, they need to know what men do and who men are. Um, anyway, so I think the heart of the program comes down to this one statement. I think it's a great quote. I love this quote. A man never stands as tall as when he stoops to help a boy. I mean, that. think, think of that. Taking that out of men's ministry as well. Think of how that you lost the uh, concept of what it means to be a man. And we just do pancake breakfast. And I'm not trying to go after anyone. I just Let's just get thoughts out there. But um, I don't know if we'll win that back. But I, I do think when men get the vision to, hey, this is my missions field. They're standing right here. Yeah. That's a cool ministry right there. Okay, let's keep going. Um, so the Royal Rangers. Um, the JBQ program. Now, I am convinced this is catechism in the Pentecostal circles, and it's a great program. You might run it, you might not run it. 576 question of scripture and doctrine, and they memorize it, and they, they have games back and forth. And if you actually look at the catechism that um, we started with by William Capers, uh, it's question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, and they're just short questions. Um, I don't know if there's many scriptures, as many scriptures in there. So it's obviously different, but whatever it is, it, this is a great tool to be used. Um, if only buy the curriculum and use it as your kids' church curriculum. I, I don't know. I mean, I just, uh, you don't have to do that either. There are great kids' church curriculums out there also. Um, okay, moving on to the next one. Uh, so JBQ. Oh, we also see during this time, lest I get caught up into programs uh, during uh, maturing Pentecostalism, we also see the rise, or the continuation, let's say, of people going out to see pe kids saved. Uh, we see a, a gal by the name of Philomena Trocine. And these are just grabbing, I, grabbing people. And these are, there's so many stories that we will never be able to tell. Maybe that we don't know, or maybe that we don't have time for. There's so many stories. Then you have um, Paul and, and uh, Myrtle Hyde healed. Um, Millions of miles of traveling, 870 cities. They, and it's kids' crusades. This is kind of the rise of kids' crusades, which we've definitely gotten away from. Um, but you know, with a different name, how cool would a kids' crusade be at this point again? Um, and maybe even with the same name. I don't know. Maybe in your co co uh, co 
context, it, it would work. I, I don't know. And then, um, you know, just finding people who, the, these are all names of people during that time frame who were evangelists to children or preteen. These are people who caught the vision. The vision never died. It started before Pentecostalism came. It was there at the beginning of Pentecostalism and it never died at any point uh, in maturing Pentecostalism. I want to look at my time here. Okay. Uh, ooh, I am over time. Um, let me just finish off my thoughts then. So, during the maturing of Pentecostalism, um, there continued to be emphasis on that. And I think, uh, I'll end it here. Let's go to the next slide. And there's some ideas there. There's some people there. Um, but uh, the, the slide after that, and then moving on to the next thing, was this. Um, us being right here. This is modern-day Pentecostalism, or spirit-filled ministry. This is what... God continues to do. This is bigger than you and you and I. There's some great things from history to con- to consider. Um, I'm going to hand this out because I want everyone to just kind of think about in your own church context. We actually have five minutes, so maybe we'll do this for five minutes. Um, the question, actually, would you mind handing those out for me, Shelley? Thank you very much. Uh, the the questions are simple. Um, and actually, let's go to the question. I think I've got the slide there, the very last one. So you can read them up if you don't get the page in time. Oh, oh, sorry. Let me get you my conclusion, then go to the questions. Yeah, I have to give you my conclusion. Through all of this, I saw three things. I wasn't intending to see anything, but it's kind of cool how God reveals things. There were some common denominators through all of Pentecostal children's ministry, through all the Spirit-filled ministry. Uh, evangelism. Throughout the whole thing, people always felt called at certain times and certain ways to evangelize children. Throughout the whole thing, people always felt called through Sunday school or um, through missionettes or Royal Rangers or JBQ to see kids discipled. We've had different modes, different ways to bring that to kids, but we've always felt called to do that. And then the last one, um, the holistic way. And I, I, I call it the holistic, thinking of orphanages, thinking of, uh, I didn't talk about this much, but the feeding programs that Convoy of Hope does, thinking of Mission of Mercy, of mercy that um, uh, brings relief, or Calcutta missions. These things were never forgotten, that we want to take care of the whole. I mean, you, you, you hear all, um, oh, what's the social justice. And I, I mean, we kind of always put our, oh, wait, social justice. And at its core, or at its logical conclusion, let's say, social justice in the church is saying Jesus came so that we could all have the same amount of stuff. Okay, that's a problem. Most people aren't actually saying that, though. So social justice is actually kind of a neat thing. But here's the thing. We've been social justice for the last 150 years before we came around. And so I don't want to lose and get lost in that whole conversation of social justice. No, no, no. Not us. Not us. No. We've been involved in that. You see that throughout our history. So if you want to take maybe, we have, we have three minutes. Maybe just sit down and think through what are some of the things, these are the questions then. Let's go to the question one, Caitlin. What are some of the things that you and your church uniquely does well with regard to evangelism to children? Or what are some of the things that you do really well with discipleship or holistic um, ministry? And then you can, you can go through that worksheet as well. Um, and then on the back, there is a back to it. What are some of the things that you would like to put in there? Um, maybe you've been thinking through, man, there's all these boys coming without fathers. Well, have I got a program for you. <laughs> call it whatever you want. I don't even care if you call it the Royal Ranger Ministry. But don't feel like you have to reinvent the wheel. Go get that stuff and start. And maybe God says to you, no, 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 I want to do it this way. Okay, you got to follow. This is spirit-empowered ministry. Nobody's saying, let's just put that in there and lock it in, unless that's what God's saying. But... Go do what God is calling you to do. So, I guess here's the, the way to end, and you can fill that out just on your own time and think it through, but um, who are you called to be? And if you're called to be Spirit-empowered, boy, there's a whole history of things to build upon. Um, 
and there's some new things. I, mean, I was hoping to get to the question of what are some of the new things that you're doing at your church because I think that would have really been a great thing for all of us to uh, start thinking through. But it's lunchtime and I've learned over the years you don't go into lunchtime. So, um, <laughs> so thank you for your time. I'm going to pray uh, and then we will head to lunch. So Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are and what you've done. All of these stories, all of these things in our past, they're awesome, they're cool. But let's not forget, it was you doing those things. It was you calling every single person. It was you creating those programs. Um, Now, you used imperfect vessels, so there's problems along the way. But Lord, it's messy, just as Rebecca shared this morning. We have messiness because you choose to use us, and I'm humbled by that. I have no idea why you continue to use me, but you do. And I'm humbled by that fact, and I want to continue to be used by you the way you have specifically built me for my calling, as Al Soto was talking about. You've formed us for a certain calling. So Lord, you've formed us to minister to children. So here's the question. How do we minister to the kids in our church and just outside our church in our community effectively so that they can be evangelized, know you, so they can be discipled, and that we can take care of holistic needs as those come up as well. I ask for a blessing upon every single person here. Anoint them for your work and bless this food to our bodies as we go to eat. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming. Have a great day.